lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I'm Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How about you? Pretty good. You yep. survived that storm? Yeah. Um, no no additional damages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty well the I same. I actually think it stood my tree back upright. A little I, bit. I saw some pictures of, um, <laughs> so there's some areas where legitimately that happened. Yeah. Like the, they had trees that were like leaning bad mm -hmm. and it was like before and afters. And yeah, the, the storm literally like stood them back up, yeah. which is pretty cool. I mean, it looks like that's what ha I didn't, I didn't tech, uh, I didn't test it against the photo that I took. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> to be sure, but it looks like it and the wind was blowing the other direction yeah. this I've, time. So I've heard some, some stories of that. Yeah. So, no, I didn't end up with any additional damage either. Still mm -hmm. got the damage from before. It's still there, and it's no better than it was, Yeah, but it's not, like, substantially worse. Did your tarp stay put? It did not. Oh, so okay. about, about midway through the storm, I hear this, like, horrible noise on the roof. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the tarp shifting. Yeah. Pretty sure I didn't set it up to shift. Yeah. So <laughs> These guys down the street from me, they, they um, had a really severe... Uh, <laughs> they had a really big tree fall on the side of their house oh, man. and um it like it went through the i mean you could see clear into their attic and you could see like the roof of the first floor oh, wow. um through there uh through the hole that was made so they had that all tarped off and i i drove by it today and um yeah, now you can see back in there again. <laughs> <laughs> Tarp's gone. And, uh, yep. I mean, the tarp's still there. It's just got some it's just some holes in some it. Some hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't gotten on the roof yet to inspect and re reattach the tarp, but we mm -hmm. didn't have a substantial amount of water come in. Mm -hmm. So I think the tarp did shift, but it wasn't like I don't think I got like an issue up there. I should yeah. be able to just restaple it and. Yeah. If, well, and this one ran by like a hurricane's supposed to. Like yeah, it only this is lasted what you like a couple of from hours from a low grade hurricane. <laughs> yeah. Like it came through, it was quick, and it yeah. was done. Yeah, um, it was moving across land at like twenty five or thirty five miles an hour, yeah. which was sweet. It was way better than the four, <laughs> or whatever <laughs> right? that Sally or two. Was doing. Sally was moving at one point at two miles an hour. Yeah, you can so. walk that fast, <laughs> right? <laughs> Ah, uh, um, well, yeah. Um, it, it almost uh, it almost put a damper on this podcast, but. Um, yeah, you know, last chance before the election. So yeah, yeah. We are you hyped? Are you ready, man? I am. I'm excited about this election, and I, I was it's thinking the most about important it. election of your lifetime. And you know, they all are. You yes, know, yeah. <laughs> but but I was thinking about it on the way here, and I was like, you know, this is going to be fun either way. Yeah. If Trump wins, it's four more years of of Trump, which has been fun. Yeah. <laughs> and if Biden wins. Dude, he's gonna have to be in the cam in front of the camera a lot. Yeah, and that's th there's no way that's not fun too. Yeah, well, I don't I don't think his presidency will last very long. And in well, fact, that's what's scary about it. So mm -hmm. the scary part is if Biden does win, he won't be there long because he mm -hmm. will have to be in front of the camera, and it'll become really obvious that this guy can't do the job anymore. Yeah, he won't make it the full term. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he may make it a couple of years. Well, I don't think he'll. I, I don't. I don't think that he'll take the oath. You don't think he'd get that far? No. Um, and if he does, I mean, if he does, I'd be surprised. But I don't if know. he does, it's not going to last long after that. I don't because think so. You I remember think you're right um, about that. a couple yeah. of weeks ago, Nancy Pelosi making her comments in front of the media about the 25th Amendment. Yes. And then they started yep. pushing through um, uh, an amend, well, uh, some extra rules essentially about the 25th amendment. Yeah. Um, I remember bill related to the 25th on. amendment yeah. and everybody was saying they're still trying to get rid of Trump, you know, Oh, they're just trying to set yeah, up for the election. It was about et Trump at all. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think it was about Trump at all. I think yeah. it was about making sure that when Biden's elected, he doesn't keep yeah. office for very long, yeah. that they can go ahead and move him out of there and get, get I'm Kamala willing, where they I'm want I'm willing her. to bet they'd let him take the oath and he'd probably last about a year. Well, you can't, you can't exercise the 25th amendment if he's not actually the president. So you got to let him take the oath. <laughs> so he gets to take the oath. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, I don't think it goes far. But after I, I don't that, think, though. I don't think, I think you're right. I think, I don't think he lasts long a year, mm. maybe two tops. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but which is scary, but <laughs> I think it would be a miracle if it was two years. You think so? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, he can hide pretty good right now because mm. of the Corona stuff. So, and that'll help. Like that's gotten him this far. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't do that in the same way as president. Oh, I agree. I absolutely agree. But it's not like they they won't try. I mean, who, I, would, I, who would have I, thought they would have ran the campaign the way they have this time? Oh, that's what they should have done with Hillary too. She'd have probably oh, won. Well, she may have won. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mm. Um, 
but but yeah, Kamala scares me. Though. Like she's she she worries me more than Biden. I think mm-hmm. Biden will just be entertaining, but yeah, Kamala actually worries me. So I don't know. Biden scares me too, but yeah, um, they all scare me, and that's kind of going to be the point of this that's, podcast. Which I think gives um, us our pivot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I did want to start with the final debate. Yeah, because um, we hadn't talked about that, and it was. I don't know. I I didn't really get into it that much. I just wrote a few things down as we went through. Yeah. I think that it was better for Trump to keep his mouth shut more. Yeah. I think think Biden talk was, he handled it a lot uh better and he had, and Trump had a few decent moments. Yeah. But he had some opportunities to like really, he did really drive some stuff home, but he, and he, and he didn't. Um, I, but you know, Oh, well that, that's okay. I mean, uh, Biden, by the end, really sounded like an idiot uh, a few times. Like there were some oh. some things that Biden said that was just like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> well, like, how can you? There's no way that people can listen to that and say, "Yeah, I want that guy." There's <laughs> That's my, guy. my guy. That's the guy. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but and like, even the first thing he said um, in his opening two minutes, uh, his he said something along the lines of uh, any. Anyone responsible for 210,000 deaths, American deaths, shouldn't be president. (laughs) And it's a good thing he added that qualifier of American deaths. Yeah. Because (laughs) Because a lot of people got a lot of blood on their hands. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's particularly him. Particularly him, him. yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And, well, you know, so I guess actually I was going to do kind of a teardown of both guys at the end, but we may as well just like throw it in, in all these places. Like Biden was one of the, one of the people mostly responsible for us entering Iraq war two. Yeah. Um, he was the, uh, head of the, which committee, the fo- foreign, foreign affairs or foreign. Something, yeah. Something like something that. Like that yeah. Anyway. Um, he was responsible for organizing the, um, the, uh, discussions in the Senate about, um, going into Iraq the second time in 2002, yeah. right? Beginning mm, in 2002. Was it that quick? Yeah. Oh, 2002. Yeah. That, that would be right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know why I was thinking. Yeah. You're right. And, um, so he was responsible for lining up the speakers and all this stuff. And yeah. he, uh, very carefully omitted anybody who would speak out against the idea of going he, he in there. He stacked the deck. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that he is uh, greatly responsible for um, for the legislature agreeing to go into Iraq. Yeah. And, uh, well, we're still there. And now they're trying to kick us out. Like, the, the government that we put in is trying to kick <laughs> us out. All right. Um, <laughs> I mean, but you're looking at hundreds of thousands of deaths. Um, oh. as a result of that. And of course he was, you know, he was there. Um, the stories now are that he was reluctant to enter some of these wars that Obama entered while they were in the white house, but who knows That's how politics. much, I mean, it's, he sure as hell didn't stop it. No, no. And I mean, he's a hawk. He's always been a hawk. Yeah. Like, I mean, that, you, that, that's what you're getting. And that's the reason we talked about it early mm-hmm. Um, after he got the nomination, mm-hmm. that that's why all of the Republican hawks have jumped. Yeah. Um, because they know who he is. Mm-hmm. Like whether, regardless of what he's saying publicly now, like they know. Yeah, that's true. That's absolutely true. So, um, he's responsible for way more than two hundred and ten thousand deaths. Yeah. Um, but they're not all American deaths, <coughs> and uh, you know. Black and brown lives matter as long as they're Americans. The black and brown lives in other parts of the world, they don't matter at all. Yeah, it doesn't seem that way. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, but that was the first thing he said, and I, I actually laughed out loud. When he I said that, I was like, that, this yeah. guy, like, he, yeah. it's, it's but, amazing to me that anybody can be so oblivious of their own history. Yeah, yeah. Of course, he might have forgotten. Who knows? Yeah, I was going to say, who to say he remembers? Yeah. Like, he may believe it. Um, of course, uh, you know, and in, in leading into that also, or not leading into it, but as a follow-up to that, then um, there was the, uh, they started talking about Russia, and Trump had this line about, no one's been tougher on Russia um, with the sanctions and everything, and he's right. I mean, there's there's a lot of truth in what he said. The problem that I have with it is, 
Like he's talking about how nobody's tougher on Russia, et cetera. And this is something that he's really proud of. This is a, this is a positive talking point to him. Yeah. Um, and he thinks it is for the electorate as well. And he, he yeah. might be right. Yeah. Um, and that's a problem just because why, why it's such a, a feather in the cap to be as antagonistic as possible to the other major nuclear power in the world <laughs> right. is completely beyond my understanding. And it's absolutely stupid. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, but it goes back to the whole macho gotta be the big man on the block. Right. I mean, that, that's what it is. And, and mm. he's, he is right that um, at least a lot of the American people will eat that up. Yeah. I mean, they will. Yeah. You Cold know. war's over guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> like uh, we have actually been friendly with Russia a lot more than we've been yeah. uh, enemies of Russia. And we should be. I mean, mm -hmm. that, there's there's plenty of reason to seek peace. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, a few thousand thermonuclear warheads is one of the big ones, I would say. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, the uh, there's all this talk about it. They're dividing us so successfully. And it came up over and over again in the debate um, with uh, mostly about COVID, of course, uh, with Trump talking about how it was the Democrat run states that are doing so badly. And um, and then, you know, Biden had some line he's trying to echo Obama with his uh, I don't see red states and blue states. They're the United States. Oh, God. When he did. And, yeah, I was like, <laughs> but seriously? it's the red states that blah, blah. I mean, I was like, it was horrible. It was yeah. like. Yeah, that was cringe. That mm. was definitely a moment. I was like, oh, wow. Ooh. Yeah. Like, so you're just, just preaching unity and immediately fall back into blaming red states for, I don't even remember what now. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't remember. I just remember the line. Opening was like, too just, early or whatever yeah, the, it the was stupid thing was. Very cringe, to say the least. Yeah. Um, and then he also, of course, he went on the, and along the same lines. I guess this is going to turn into a foreign policy podcast. I didn't really intend for it to, but these are the things that, yeah. th these things really matter, even though yeah. people don't seem to really care. Well, they haven't really came up in, my bad, it was my okay. feet. <laughs> and then it was my chair. Um, um, but they haven't came up in this cycle enough. None of this stuff has, mm -hmm. like as far as the foreign policy stuff is concerned. That's true, but all it does is illustrate how they're both on the same side when it comes to all that. Really. It's true. Oh, yeah. Um, so, Absolutely. you know, there's the talk about North Korea and Biden going on about how um, how Trump messed up with North Korea. Now, I will say for Trump's case that there were a bunch of bureaucrats that intentionally screwed up talks. Yeah. You know, one of the chief among them being our, our old friend, uh, John Bolton. Oh, good old Bolton. <laughs> um, who, you know, said that we're taking the Libya model. <laughs> uh, that of course ended with Gaddafi being <laughs> sodomized to death in the streets, yeah. and I'm sure that Kim said, uh, "Yeah, I don't want to be part of the Libya mob." Yeah, yeah, we're not. Yeah, I'm not okay with that. <laughs> yeah. Like, whatever I got to do to not have that happen. <laughs> yeah, I know that, that's the worst possible outcome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so I mean, I, I think that Trump was kind of sabotaged. Now, part of it is that you know there was an issue with Trump. Um, you know, they kept pressing for, "Well, we're not going to talk about anything until we." we denuclearize and, and, uh, and that was a sticking point because yeah. again, you know, along the Libya model, um, when you get rid of your nuclear, I, history hath shown, <laughs> yeah, right. um, that if you get rid of your nuclear weapons and talks with the U S you've just invited an invasion yeah. like that, that is your best chance of staving off a U.S. invasion as being a nuclear power, which is the whole reason that they go for this anyway, right. is to, they, I mean, that is protection. Like, yeah. It, Talk about perverse incentives. Right? Exactly. Um, so, uh, then, <laughs> um, Biden said, talked about how he screwed all this up and he's like, uh, we're going to talk about denuclearization and, and we're not going to legitimize you talking about Kim, of course. Yeah. And, uh, we're going to continue to put stronger sanctions on you. And that's why, uh, Kim, uh, wouldn't meet with he and Obama. That's what he yeah. was saying. Yeah. Now, of course, Trump was talking about denuclearization and the whole thing about, we're not going to legitimize you, uh, North Korea has been there since the fifties. Yeah. All right. right? North, this, this guy, he's not an upstart dictator. Yeah. Like he inherited this from his father who inherited this from his grandfather. Like they've been around they, for a yeah, while. This has They're, been going on for a minute. They've been, North Korea has been a member of the UN since the early nineties. Oh wow. I didn't right? know that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 91, I think. Really? Um, <laughs> 
so between ninety and ninety two. Anyway, something like that. Um, yeah. And uh, Still, yeah. so, yeah, it, we're we're not going to legitimize you. Like they're legitimate. They, they're yeah. a real country. Well, <laughs> and that, there was a so. lot of that talk even when when Trump was in the negotiations and doing all of that. Like mm-hmm. that that was like the big. Oh, I can't believe he's he's talking with these people and blah yeah. blah blah. I'm like, why would you not? Like, yeah. I mean, it, it makes no sense to just. Uh, well, we're going to push for harder sanctions. Yes. Okay, well, we're going to starve these people some more than mm-hmm. they already are. Because in, just remember, anytime somebody says pushing for harder sanctions, that's what you're doing. Yeah. Is you're, you're, you're starving people in this country mm-hmm. to try to get them to overthrow the leader. Yeah. Like, that's what yeah. you're doing. You, you've made them weak and hope that they start a war with their yeah. uh, government. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, no, that's that. Uh, it's just irritates me. <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, that's obviously the worst thing about it, but, um, even setting that aside, like, okay, we're going to negotiate, but what we're actually going to do is dictate terms. Now are you ready to sit down at the negotiating table? Yeah, How often does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Never. Not going to happen. Yeah. Not going to happen. I mean, it's just a dumb approach and he's, tr- he's trying to be the big man there. Like yeah. show what a tough guy he is. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so that was, which I mean, if you remember, like Trump played that whole tough guy thing at the beginning of his administration and then mm-hmm. ended up flipping. And because, I mean, that's how it started. I mean, there was a lot of talk at the, I forget what was the, where he called him Rocket Man or yeah, something. Yeah. yeah. Like there was a whole big thing there. Mm-hmm. But they And ended talking up, about wiping him off the map and all yeah. that kind of stuff. I mean, there was yeah. a lot of talk, I mean, about a nuclear first strike on North Korea and things. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I remember. I mean, that. I think that that's part of Trump's negotiating tactic. I don't. Is to come hard and then yeah, flip. Yeah. yeah. And then say, oh, okay, well, maybe we can make an agreement about this. Like you, yeah. you come like you're not going to be able to. Um, to do anything and then yeah, yeah. and then you, you back off of something and get your way to yeah. some degree yeah I don't advise this as a negotiating <laughs> tactic particularly but it I mean, seems it's his to be style. his approach yeah. yeah yeah um and then of course <laughs> you talk about like the really ridiculous things that are said um as Biden with his there's no evidence that raising minimum wage puts a small businesses out <laughs> <laughs> oh god yeah um, okay. Yeah. I mean, this is, goes back to, you know, Democrats are being the party of science, except when it comes to, uh, economics, economics and yeah. biology. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> no joke. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, and so I, I guess we can, our minimum wage, um, uh, episode was uh, one of the classic episodes and we haven't republished it. So it's not available oh, it's to not. anybody. Yeah. Um, but just to summarize real quickly, uh, if you raise the price of labor, okay. So first off, Let's just start thinking about this in terms of supply and demand, all right? Um, You know, supply and demand and prices all interact in a very particular way. And if you raise prices, you lower demand and you increase supply, which lower, you know. Um, So, yeah, they're right. I need to draw this, actually, (laughs) to to, to make sure um, that I've got this right. But, uh, you know, okay. So um, as the su- supply of something goes up, then um, prices uh, tend to drop. Mm-hmm. It uh, increases demand because um, lower demand uh, or lower prices um, allow more people to, to purchase the, the product, etc. So when you increase prices um, f- on labor, yeah, yeah. Uh, then you lower demand for labor and um, – you have a uh, higher supply of workers, but a lower supply of jobs. Yeah. All right. Um, and then, uh, so w- when you have workers competing for jobs instead of jobs competing for workers, it puts a, a downward pressure on prices. Right. All right. So the, the price of labor should go down. And so what you're doing by creating a minimum wage is you are putting a bunch of people out of work and you have a, the situation where a lot of businesses, uh, particularly small businesses, run on small margins. Oh, yeah. Um, so they either eliminate the workers or they eliminate their product. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Essentially. Absolutely. And or raise the price for their product. Right. Like, um, yeah, which and, creates more problems. <laughs> well, and that's the other part of that. So just yeah. uh, just assume that you raise, and they're talking about doubling them. Oh, yeah. Wage. They're going crazy, um, man. Like, it's scary. And there's also a very small percentage of people that actually work for minimum wage, and most of them don't well, work for very long at minimum wage. That's always, entry level. Anytime I, exactly. Anytime I get into the minimum wage conversation with people, I just remind them that, that it is, it's an entry level position. Mm-hmm. And what you do when you create a minimum wage, regardless of what that wage is, is you create 
a a barrier for entry. Mm-hmm. So there are some people that can't even meet the minimum wage requirements as far as like being able to be valuable as productivity. To, yeah. yeah be, as, to be valuable for the company. Mm-hmm. Um, like, so the lower you have the minimum wage, the more doors you open for people with less opportunity. Right. Because a minimum wage job can turn into a career, but a minimum wage job is not a career, mm-hmm. no matter where you are. Yeah. It's, it's an entry level position and that's all it is. So when you raise it up in that manner, you you eliminate people from even being able to get a job. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's just the way it is. Well, and who is the government to dictate to you what terms you make voluntarily with somebody else for your labor? Exactly. Hey, well, exactly. I mean, that's just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, all of these things are voluntary. Like, you can talk about how, well, they're forced into a job because they have to have a job. Well, yeah. if you... First off, if you raise the minimum wage, you may put them out of a job entirely. Yeah. Um, but if you don't have a minimum wage, or let's just say, if I want to come in and I, I need to work, yeah. and I am willing to work for you for $3 an hour, yeah. who is the government to say that... That's not enough. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, you either you either pay him seven fifty or you don't hire him at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I won't hire. Him. Well, I won't hire him at all. Thanks and a lot. There's all kinds of positions out there that don't even mm-hmm. exist with companies because they they can't afford to have like mm-hmm. they can't afford to pay the the value isn't there. Right. But you you shut the door on people who who could take that position and do something with it. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just it's it irritates once again. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and then of course, even if you if it worked the way you wanted, yeah, sort of to some degree. If it worked to the way you wanted to some degree, um, if you double the price of labor everywhere, yeah, I, and of course you wouldn't. Like if you're moving seven fifty to fifteen dollars an hour. Only two percent or something of the workforce works for minimum wage anyway. Yeah. Um. And uh, but let's just say that what it did was it it raised labor costs across all industries by twenty percent. Yeah. All right. Well, all those companies can't eat those costs. <laughs> so it also raises the cost of everything that's sold, all the products, by 20% yeah. at least. But here's oh, yeah. the other problem there. So you've raised that that labor cost by 20% at every step along the chain from production to um, to the consumer, yeah. transport, and everything else. Oh, yeah. Right? So in the end, that the cost of that good is going to go more than 20%. So you've Im- increased people's incomes by 20% and increased the cost of their goods by 30%. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm making up these numbers, but you understand but, the point. But that's, the, yeah, that's how these things trickle down. Yeah, like, so you just made everybody that much poorer. Actually, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's uh, anyway. And, we need to do a podcast on um, minimum wage again and okay. publish it. <laughs> yeah, um, I can probably dig out that last one. We'd have to cut some stuff because you gave out some personal information in that one. Yeah, um, but I yeah. I can bleep it. <laughs> <laughs> right, something we definitely need to do one because this is something we can spend some time on for sure. Absolutely, and, and it's an important subject that a lot of people are misinformed on. Mm-hmm. That's true. Um, yeah, I mean, cause it just sounds so nice. Well, yeah. And, uh, and this is one I mean, of the I've, things that Gary Johnson was actually really good on. Like he yeah. was, he was really good at talking about this because yeah. his point and, and it's well, such was, a good he had one. owned businesses before. Though. Well, yeah, he I was mean, an he entrepreneur. He understands and, the, like, and how this is going to affect. Yeah. Absolutely. But it was something that he expressed to people well, which was yeah. the real problem was, with was, Gary Johnson. <laughs> true. Um, and well, one of the problems with Gary Johnson, but, yeah. uh, I mean, but that was a, like one thing that he had a lot of trouble with was actually like expressing these ideas in ways that people understand understood yeah and but the minimum wage was something that he did a really good job on because he'd say okay so you're saying that if we move from 750 to 15 dollars an hour that's better everybody's wealthier right yeah. yes well why don't we just move it to 75 dollars an hour yeah then everybody's that much then they're yeah. 10 times wealthier right? <laughs> right well you can't do that well why not yeah yeah i mean Explain if it's good to, to me go, why that doesn't work yeah and then if I'll, it's, if it's you made my to, argument for me <laughs> yeah if it's good to move from 750 to 10 or from 10 to 12 or from 12 to 15 yeah. why isn't it good to move to 75 yeah exactly exactly yeah and love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and of course, people get flustered, and then well, yeah. uh, well, they always get angry. Well, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. Well, why? Explain yeah. to me why it's ridiculous. Yeah. Why does the one thing work but the other thing doesn't? Exactly. Exactly. It's the same I mean, concept. Exactly. Make, yeah. Make me understand why it's ridiculous. Yeah. At least make an <laughs> argument about diminishing returns or something. Yeah. Like there's like, something that you, you could gotta, say to. Yeah. You gotta have <laughs> a retort to this. Like, yeah. So. Um. 
And then uh, I, there's really is there anything else in the, the debate that you wanted to point out? Uh, not really. I mean, um, I, I feel like um, Trump really pinned Biden pretty good on the oil stuff, on the fracking, oh, and yeah. all of that. Um, I think that was that was probably that was probably with everything that Trump kind of had at his disposal. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like that was the best thing he was able to really pin him on. He could have yeah. done so much more as far as attacking him, but that was kind of the best he got. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he took his opportunity about Hunter's stuff he um, did. a little bit. It but didn't, I, he didn't I, explain Biden it. Biden brought it up first, which I thought was really weird. That seems like poor planning, <laughs> planning but, right? um, yeah. or poor coaching or something. Oh, yeah. um, and, and he didn't really go for the jugular like he could have, I don't think. But I, I feel like he should have <clears> done a better job of explaining all of that and driving it home. But Yeah. I mean, because that's the big question, right? And, yeah. and we can... Um, kind of transitioned this into other things. Yeah. Um, the, I don't think it's in dispute at this point that that stuff was Hunter Biden's. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, there's, I, I there's, don't think there's any question about that now. Yeah. Um, it's and, been verified. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so there's some question about who they were talking about, who's the big guy, yeah. um, and all that stuff. But use a little common sense and tell me who yeah. you think the big guy is. Like, I mean, come on. Yeah, and there was that business partner that said that that, um, that it was Joe Biden, Biden was getting a cut and yeah. of all this stuff. And of course, this is a guy who's been a career politician and is very wealthy. Yeah. at this point in his well, life, and, and he hadn't. I mean, like, he's not like he's, he's been, been a in, great politician either. Well, and he's he's been in politics basically all mm-hmm. of his life. It's not like I mean, at least that's Trump's argument is that he made all of his money before he got in politics. Yeah, like not that I really buy. I mean, I know he did make a bunch of money before he got into politics, but I don't really buy all of the. But at least he has that argument. Yeah. Well, know? and uh, okay, so this is a little bit off track, uh, a bit of a tangent, but um, but Joe Biden brought up. Trump's taxes again. Yeah. In that. And anybody who's been a career politician should never should never criticize anybody about how much taxes they're paying. Yeah. Because if if you look at it in a real sense, yeah. Joe Biden has never paid taxes in his life. <laughs> He's lived off taxes. Exactly. Yeah. Like if you if you are paid out of taxes. Yeah. <laughs> you're not really paying taxes when you pay back in. Oh man, how like, amazing just, would it have been if Trump had like thrown that at him in the debate? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I don't think that Trump really understands that either. Well, he I, doesn't. I don't think, but most people don't some, think of it that way no, because most they're people, like, oh well, no, I pay my twenty two percent or twenty eight percent or whatever yeah. his level is, just like everybody else. No, but if you if you fill a bucket with water out of a tub and you pour some of that water from the bucket back into the tub, yeah. It still came from the top. Yeah, it all came from the same place. Yeah. Like it was all stolen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all that water in the tub was stolen. Stolen. And, That's all I'm saying. Man. And your bucket was just taking stolen water out. You put some of that stolen water back, but it's still yeah, it's, all it's still from the all, same place. Yeah. And so, I, like, think about this. I, I want everybody to understand this: yeah. that anybody who is paid as a public servant, anybody who is paid out of by government, yeah. out of taxes. Yeah. No matter what they put back in, they don't pay taxes. Yeah. I mean, they may technically pay taxes in the sense that the income that they get from that same, you know, from tax money, they put some of it back in. Yeah. But, but they, they didn't. But yeah, exactly. Because just like you just explained. Like, yeah. yeah. It all came from the same place. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I remember years ago uh, listening to, there was a podcaster that I used to listen to pretty regularly. It's uh, Jen Briney at the Congressional Dish podcast. Yeah. Um, and she used to just like almost exclusively cover legislation that was going through the House of Representatives. And it was a really excellent podcast then. Um, she's yeah. gotten involved in some other stuff and she is, uh, she has a very different perspective on things than I do. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, with limited time to listen to stuff, I ended up cutting her podcast out of my regular thing. Every once in a while, I'll listen to one if I see that there's a, a Looks really like interesting she's covering topic. Some Congress yeah. stuff, yeah. Um, but, for the most part, I don't listen anymore. It's kind of sorry, Jen. Uh, anyway, um, there was one where she was talking about Puerto Rico after the the storm Maria. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, no, no, it wasn't even about that. Actually, I think that it was after Maria, but um, it was really just about how uh, the government was manipulating things in Puerto Rico, all this austerity stuff and so forth, because the the state the 
the state was broke. Yeah. Um, and so they were eliminating all these, uh, these government positions and so forth. And she was like, how can you do that? When the problem is that you're not generating enough revenue for the government, how can you cut these jobs with people paying taxes? <laughs> no, no, it's a net gain for the government because their salary came out of taxes. <laughs> exactly. Even if they're paying taxes back in, that's not an improvement. Like it, yeah, it is, if you, if you get $50,000 in tax money and you give $10,000 back, when you eliminate that position, you you're get, plus, you get it all back. <laughs> yeah, you're plus you're plus forty, not yeah, <laughs> not yeah. plus ten. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So Ooh. anyway, um, so obviously people don't yeah. don't and think about it like smart. that. She's oh, smart. I used yeah. to listen to that podcast too. She's mm-hmm. definitely intelligent. So for her to kind of miss that yeah. is it goes to show it's missed by a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um. So any, anyway, the point about the Hunter Biden stuff though is that this is a real example of significant corruption. And yeah. and and so let's let's probably not just leave that at well, you know, it's a corrupt politician. You got to worry about a corrupt politician. You're talking about a politician who who really is getting payments from the Chinese Communist Party, uh from um Ukrainian oligarchs. Uh <laughs> you know, etc. Um, Ukrainian oligarchs who are fighting with Russia over the the western part of their country. Um, For all the talk of, of Russia, or uh, Trump is a puppet of Russia mm-hmm. and all of that, like, who's really a puppet of who here? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, to say that, to make the argument that, that Biden's not paid off by China mm-hmm. gets harder and harder the more that comes out about this laptop. Yeah. And what you talk about Trump owing money to uh, Chinese banks or something like that, and that that's a real security risk. What about the security risk of the Chinese Communist Party having access to some of this information on this laptop, as an example? Absolutely. Um, you know, of personal information about, you know, Hunter Biden's drug use and yeah. uh, sexual exploits and so on. What yeah. what kind of uh, security risk does that create? Exactly. Um, and th- those are the kind of things that maybe people should be talking about a little bit more. I don't Absolutely. have enough of an understanding of this to really do a deep dive, but I mean, this seems like something that should be important this, to... This should be talked about, and the media is doing everything under the sun to not cover this. And mm-hmm. not just the media, social media, the whole gambit. Yeah. Like, they're all, like, in cahoots trying to... And it's... It's really quite amazing to watch it. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, it, it really is. And it, they could, I don't know how this election is going to go, but they, this just this issue being swept the way it has been mm-hmm. could change the election, could could throw it to Biden. Yeah. It'd be enough. I don't think it will, but I, I, I agree that it could. And it's, it's amazing to see this kind of unified effort to support a particular candidate. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's scary to me because— oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, we're seeing this now, and I mean, this this is bothersome enough, and it just it this seems, has been the great thing about Trump's presidency, though, too. It's been a big middle finger to all of us. Well, and it's exposed <laughs> so much. Of well, this. oh yeah, it, I, I mean, it's, it's made it impossible to ignore. Yeah, yeah. Well, mainly because he gets out there and talks about it, and mm-hmm. he's willing to go places that a, a normal politician isn't. Mm-hmm. Like a normal politician would not attract, attack Biden on any of this stuff. Yeah. Um, because they know, in the end of the day, they're just as guilty of it anyway. Mm-hmm. Not saying that Trump's innocent by any means. Just saying, yeah, that Trump's willingness to go there <laughs> yeah. is is different. It, that's true. Um, and one other thing about the debate is there was a point in. Um, We can transition from here, too, but um, there was a point in the debate where Trump was talking about reopening schools. Yeah. And he said, um, there's essentially no chance uh, of your children getting sick and dying from this virus. Yeah. Um, You know, so send the kids back to school, et cetera. And the moderator uh, says something about, well, the CD has uh, said that kids can get sick. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Sure, but that nobody that, said they couldn't. Yeah. yeah, how does that? That's not a counter to what Trump just said. Yeah, absolutely. Right, but it was it was set up like one. Yeah, and he didn't get a chance to respond to that. Yeah, and right. uh, and the moderator interrupting with that kind of information is kind of silly in what's supposed to, as a moderator anyway. Yeah, but um, anyway, the 
and this whole coronavirus thing is completely out of control. And one of the interesting things that I've seen since the debate is uh, somebody pressing um, Trump about that Biden says that he's just given up on the yeah. virus, um, yeah. that he's, you know, th- waving the white flag or thrown in the towel or whatever, you know, metaphor they were using. Yeah. And, um, and he said, no, I haven't. It's Biden that's thrown in the towel. It's, you know, <laughs> it's, it, and, and he's right. Yeah. I think Trump's right on this. You know, yeah. Trump's saying, get out there and live your life still. And Biden's saying, no, 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 we've got a lo- lockdown. That's the guy who is playing defense. Yeah. Oh, I wholeheartedly mm-hmm. agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, and this is, you know, this is obviously this is, coronavirus thing has gone on way too long. Um, yeah. and it's, it's gotten to the point of just absolute absurdity. And, yeah. um, I mean, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this cause I know some people are really tired of hearing about it, but you're not yeah. hearing the right things. And that's, that's the, the problem. Um, <laughs> you know, in Europe, they are, uh, like a lot of places in Europe are dealing with a second or third wave, like big spikes in cases. Yeah. Now, first off, a case is anybody who got a uh, a positive result on the mostly on the PCR test, the polymerase chain reaction. Yeah. It's not a test. First yeah. off, the yeah. PCR. We did PCR stuff when I did anthropology yeah. um, on old bones and so forth. And the whole idea was that you're magnifying genetic material, you're trying to find little bits and pieces, and um, and uh, magnify it to a point that you can you can actually do some examination of it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's what the PCR test does. And we're all carrying around little bits and pieces of viruses with us all the time. Yeah. And so the idea that, like, well, okay, so the polymerase chain reaction is a process, not a test. Yeah. Let, let's just put it like that. All and right. they've cycled it up to such a high level that, that they're magnifying to the point that it doesn't mean anything when you get a positive result. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you're sick. Yeah. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that you're sick. So all these case counts don't mean as much as they, they want to claim. They're made out to be. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you have things like, uh, well, you know, there's been tens of thousands of cases connected to students going back to school, uh, you know, college, yeah. um, colleges and universities. And tens and thousands of cases. And uh, that sounds really terrible. Yeah. Um, except that when you look at it, there's been like, from those cases, there's been like three hospitalizations and no deaths. Yeah. Um, sorry, well, I mean, that like the flu, I mean, you're talking about flu-like levels here. This is well, not a big deal. And that's been kind of my point for a while now is that, you know, it would be a different scenario like if the bodies were piling up. Mm-hmm. Like if, if like one out of every five people that got this died. Yeah. Like, it'd be serious stuff. But, mm-hmm. I mean, you're, you're right. It's basically at the level that the flu is at as mm-hmm. far as all of these the stuff is concerned. It's just not what it's made out to be. Yeah. Goods are not as advertised. Mm-hmm. Well, and you remember at the beginning of this, they were predicting over 2 million deaths in the U.S. Yeah. 2 million deaths in the U.S. Deaths, yes, um, absolutely. We're at like 220,000, less than, I think. Um, and if you'll also remember back at the beginning when uh, they were starting to institute all these policies, um, this was a couple of months in when they'd actually learned a little bit about the virus. Yeah. Um, is uh, that Dr. Burks, do you remember her? She used yeah. to be part of this team that would, would uh, tell stuff to the press, but she, I guess she was saying the wrong things, <laughs> and so they don't listen to her anymore. But um, yeah. Dr. Burks was saying, look, even if we do everything right, you're still looking at probably 200,000 deaths. Yeah. So, I mean, in retrospect, I would say, and I would say just in general, because I believe wholeheartedly that a government cannot protect you from a virus. Yeah. I mean, there's Um, nothing they can do about this anyway. But I I don't think that Trump's done a bad job with this. No. And And I'm surprised he's not out touting some of these projections versus what it's ended mm -hmm. up to be a little stronger. Well, he has brought it up a few times. He's brought it up a few times, but it seems like that would be the only thing coming out of his mouth. Yeah, it should be. As big a deal as this is and Mm -hmm. as the media is. Well, the problem is that when he starts saying that, people are like, oh, you don't care about the 200,000 people that have died? You know, you got Biden saying, your family with the empty chair at the (laughs) table. I mean. Yeah. Come on. Like, yeah, exactly. And it's not that we I mean, don't care. It, it's you not. You start to run into questions that like, like real ethical questions about what you're willing to trade for what. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, you know, part of the problem here is that the entire idea of public health now revolves around this one virus. Yeah. But the reaction to this one virus is affecting a lot of other areas of it's public health that don't get any talk. Everything, yeah. yeah. Um, Everything's touched by this. And so the question becomes like, okay, so are you willing to trade 100,000 lives to save 200,000 lives? Yeah. Well, it seems like you probably would. Like, you come out on a net gain there. Okay, well, so what if the 100,000 lives you trade are all young people in their 20s and 30s, and the lives that you're saving are all 70 and older? Yeah. Does it seem like a fair trade then? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so what about the 100,000 lives? <laughs> if the 100,000 lives that you traded were people who were generally healthy until you decided to trade in their lives for 200,000 people that had health problems yeah. um, that may not have survived three years anyway. Um, is it a fair trade then? I mean, uh, yeah, it, so, gets, it gets complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the, it's, it, it's an interesting question, but what I'm looking at in Europe is that they were talking at the beginning about Sweden, how, you know, Sweden was a cautionary tale. Um, through yeah. their kind of laissez-faire reaction to it. Yeah. Um, and and it wasn't entirely laissez-faire, but comparatively. But yeah, I mean, if I mean, you they look at everybody locking, else, yeah. yeah. They weren't yeah. locking down. Well, most of their measures were voluntary. So the yes. government encouraged people to wear masks and distance, mm -hmm. but it, mm -hmm. it wasn't required. It wasn't. Yeah, and they did not shut schools. They didn't shut nothing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and uh, so they had comparable um, curves at the beginning of the virus. Uh, yeah. to the other countries that did lock down, yeah. um, including countries like France and Germany who locked down pretty hard pretty early. Yeah. Um, now, months later, nobody's talking about Sweden anymore. Yeah. Let me tell you why. <laughs> it's because all these countries that locked down real hard, yeah. um, they've started... To, they, are locking down again because well, of that's the second they, wave. They're, yeah. they're locking down again because when they started letting people out, the virus started to spread again. Yeah. Because you don't eradicate the virus in this way. Yeah. You just slow the spread. But eventually people have to come outside and interact with each other again. <laughs> and as soon as they do, the virus starts to spread again. Exactly. Now, Sweden never did all that lockdown stuff. Yeah. And they're not getting another wave. Yeah. Because Their curve they, has remained low. Yeah, because they've already bared the brunt of it, basically. Yeah. Well, yeah. but the, their bearing the brunt of it wasn't really any worse than anybody else. Yeah. They're just not dealing with it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and if everybody would think back, the the whole idea of flattening the curve wasn't to stop the virus. It was mm -hmm. to to make sure the hospitals didn't get overwhelmed right. and spread out the amount of people having to go to the hospital. Um, I mean, that's what, that was the whole argument. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one I, like I said, I'm not for the government doing it, but it's one I understood and kind of bought into at the time. I was like, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. We, like, we don't know how bad this is. and We don't want to overwhelm yeah. the hospitals. Like mm -hmm. that's, that, that obviously is bad. Like, yeah. I that mean, leads to more deaths without a doubt. Without question. Yeah. Exactly. So, but you don't hear that anymore. Like no. that's not the, it, it's all cases in in fear. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, you don't even hear that argument anymore. Yeah. Now, and we should talk before Thanksgiving about California's rules for Thanksgiving. Oh God. Um, it's, it's insane. Um, and you certainly don't want the government that involved in it. I would, I don't understand why anybody would agree to that, but yeah, m moving on from, from yeah. that point, um, you know, the, the virus is kind of doing its thing and it's doing its thing no matter what. And, you yeah. know, the government reaction hasn't had really any impact at all. Yeah. Um, all it has done is like delayed the inevitable, if anything. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then you got, and you want to talk about just, uh, completely, um, fact free kind of, uh, legislation or rules about it to try to try and prevent the virus. Like something that has really no basis whatsoever. When you talk about, uh, well, no more than 10 people in a place or, um, uh, why is that? The number's totally the, arbitrary. The one what that about, gets me, okay. Uh, the, there's one that gets me is the curfews. Yeah. So, because, so all you do, and I, like I say, I work in retail, so I understand how like customer flows and stuff work. Mm -hmm. If you limit the times that you're available to, for people to shop, 
yeah. the more people you're going to have in a building at one time. Yeah. So if your idea is is we need to like distance and keep people away from each other, curfews aren't the way to do it. Yeah. You want to expand time, mm-hmm. not contract it. Yeah. Like, oh, it irritates me. Yeah. <laughs> well, and uh, so there's a few things, though, like the, the 9 o'clock curfews in all these places, and um, there's a couple of places that have banned alcohol sales after a certain point. Yeah. Like, not just from bars and restaurants, but like... Uh, just from, in general. Yeah, retail stores and so forth. Yeah. Uh, because apparently we now know that the <laughs> uh, COVID virus is a social drinker that only comes out at night. <laughs> exactly. So you can stop the spread by telling people to go home before it gets dark and not drink. And not drink. Yeah. yeah. Even in their own home. I mean, that's how absurd this is. It like, is. and if you think about it in a realistic way, you're like, wait, what, how does this, this make any sense? No sense. It, yeah. But it goes back to our thing is it's all about control. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's all any of this is you give government this leash. They're going to run wild. Man. Yeah. Like they just, they are. Mm-hmm. Well, um, to wrap up, uh, really quickly here, um, let's just do a quick one rundown on these two candidates. Yeah. Um, so Biden, is a, a partial architect of the second Iraq war and our interventions all across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, he wrote the 94 crime bill. Yeah. Um, some of you may not be aware of this, but when the Patriot act was passed, he was like, Oh, I wrote this legislation years ago. <laughs> and I don't doubt it. Yeah. Um, and of course, I believe him. <laughs> you know, he's all in on these lockdowns. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, No, no question. Like, he's definitely the lockdown candidate, which, once again, scares me. (laughs) Now, so to dispel any myth that I might be supporting Trump. uh, (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) Now, Trump has done some positive things while in office. Um, And I don't know how much you can uh, attribute to Biden, but, uh, you know, the Obama administration did some positive things, too. Some of which Trump has undone. Um, One of them being the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and of course the, that's one that Trump has undone. And I thought that that was one of the few really good things that the Obama administration did. I was disappointed about that too. I yeah. just real quick, I had, when he did that, I was like, he's going to undo this and then come back and redo it mm-hmm. and then claim, put, just put his stamp on it. Yeah. And that's not what happened. Like he no. is, he, not only has he walked away from that, he has intensified, um, sanctions and, and yeah. just just antagonizing them mm-hmm. in, in a way that that's that's bad. Yeah. So, um, you know, partially Bolton influence, I believe, but uh, but he he was pretty hawkish on Iran before he went Even, into office. He was. Yeah. Um, and uh, and of course, uh, you know, another thing that the Obama administration did that I, I was really positive about was um, starting to normalize relations with Cuba. Yep. I don't know what Biden had to do with that. If anything, yeah. but that's, but that, you know, that's something that, administration. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we can attribute at least to some degree that to him yeah. as a positive thing. Um, Trump has reduced a bunch of regulations um, yeah. affecting businesses in a wide range of fields yeah. that has made it easier to start businesses, that has made it easier to maintain businesses. And, and that it, all of that is positive. It creates jobs. It drives down prices in those fields. Um, it, you know, it's what you, it's what you, it was what we would want. Yes. It's something we would advocate for. Exactly. Now, uh, and he has continued to talk about ending forever wars. Yeah. He has done a lot of talk. Yes. <laughs> a exactly. lot of talk. <laughs> but we're still in Afghanistan. Yep. We're still in Syria. We're still in Iraq. We're still in Somalia. We're still in, we're, we're still, we're still everywhere. everywhere. Yes. Yeah. Um, and he actually actively blocked uh, legislation that would have put an end to our support of the Yemen war. Yeah. Um, which is probably the single worst thing that this government is involved in. Yeah. And now it was started by Obama. Yeah. But Trump has continued it. Yeah. And even before he started drawing back in, in Afghanistan and in Syria, um, the first thing that Trump did was expand every war. Yeah, uh, he hasn't started any new ones. That's to that's this. a really low bar, but that <laughs> is a positive thing. Yeah. But he did because expand every war that we were already involved in. Yeah, absolutely. So. And he's talked a lot about getting out of Afghanistan, of getting out of uh, Somalia. Um, great. I mean, I, I hope that he does that, but he hasn't done it. And he yeah. did talk about getting out of Syria, but then they convinced him to keep people there to guard the oil. Yeah. <laughs> so you know. Um, and then, of course, there's the China trade war, which has been terrible for all of us. Yeah, yeah. No winners in that war. Yep. Um, so, like, the the summary is, 
Both of these people are terrible. Yeah. And you're going to continue to get... So think of how confident the two major parties are that you will vote for one of them. Yeah. And they don't really care which one when it comes down to it because there's not a whole lot of difference between them. There's not. I mean, And I, they're so confident that you're going to vote for one of them that they put up Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump in 2016. And in 2020, they're putting up Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and, and Joe Biden was like the golden child. Like, I mean, they, yeah. they tried every, they put everybody else up, but like mm-hmm. Joe Biden was like, like their guy. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean. Yeah. And even if you think of him as a placeholder, he's a placeholder for Kamala Harris. Yeah. Yeah. That's who he picked as his running mate. Right. Like, I mean. And so if you want to put in it, so here's my theory on voting. Whenever I go into the voting booth on at this level, yeah. um, I vote for as many third party candidates as I can, and I never vote for an incumbent. Yeah. Fire them all. Yeah. Every time. Every time. Fire them all. Yeah. Um, because they're all terrible. Oh. And the only way that you can make them accountable is if you start getting rid of them. Yeah. And uh, and if you really want to change, seriously, don't vote for a Republican or a Democrat. If you go yeah. in there afraid that if you if you're um, more if you hate Trump less, but you're afraid that if you vote for a third party candidate, it'll give Biden an opening, or the other way around. Then they have already beaten you. Yeah, you need to get won. over that. Yeah. It's all of you being too fearful to go out there and vote for somebody that you actually support. That you'll vote for somebody that you don't like, but you don't like less than you don't like the other guy. Yeah. That's how we end up in this situation over yeah. and over and over again, where they can put up terrible candidates, and you're going to vote for one of them. Yeah. So get and out the there. And I, I don't really can't get much more terrible. Yeah. I mean, I watched Idiocracy the other night, <laughs> and. <laughs> Like, I don't know, like maybe it can get worse, but I don't know, man. Like I see a lot of parallels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've heard that a lot recently. Um, so, and I'm not saying go in there and vote for a libertarian candidate. Obviously I would prefer that you would vote for a libertarian candidate, although there's plenty of libertarian candidates that I wouldn't support too. Yeah. But like, I mean, when it comes down to it, just on the general ideology of the parties, I would prefer that you vote for a libertarian candidate or a constitution party candidate or somebody like that. Yeah. But Hey man, if you are, a socialist go in there and vote for the green party candidate i don't care when it really comes down to it i don't care who you vote for but i think that you're making a huge mistake if you go in and you vote for a republican or a democrat ever again we we really do have to find a way in this country to break up the two parties Mm -hmm. like i mean there's just we have to do it like it's something that's got to happen one way or the other Mm -hmm. um and i don't know i don't know how that gets done but there's got to be a way with something i mean Something has to be done. Just, well, I'll say once again, um, you know, I say it with some frequency when it gets around to election time, is that uh, voting for a third party is not a wasted vote. Voting for a candidate you don't believe in is a wasted vote. Yeah. yeah. So vote for somebody you believe in. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've always, vo- I've never voted for a major party candidate and I've always voted libertarian in presidential mm-hmm. elections. Never yeah. voted RD, always the libertarian. Yeah. Um, and, and done that with pride, even though, even when I haven't been fully behind the candidate, like, Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I voted for some good ones, but there's been some, some, uh, I pine for the days of Harry Brown. Yeah. I I voted for (laughs) Harry Brown. That was actually my first election I got to vote in. I Mm -hmm. voted for Harry Brown, which I didn't know a lot about him, but, um, but I knew enough, like I had looked into him. Like I, I, I knew where I was as far as politics was by then. Yeah. That was the first president I voted for. I had Really? Been able to vote in previous elections, but I, that was the first election that I voted. You actually in. did vote in, yeah, yeah, because yeah. um, I really like that guy. And so, hey, yeah, go ahead and YouTube Harry Brown. By the way, yeah, you'll you'll get some interesting talks there. Oh yeah, um, dude, he's he's good, man. And uh, yes, and, and so, in, enjoy election season. We're <laughs> looking forward to at least something interesting. So this is it for us. Like, so we'll be on the other side of the election next time we record. Yep. Unless we decided to do something special, but I don't think we got anything in mind. 
Uh, we, we just got too much. I'd like to do another short one before then, but I just don't think we're going to be able yeah, to. I, I had thought so. about it the other day and was like, man, if we could do like a sh- something short this weekend, but looking at my schedule, like mm-hmm. I can't uh, commit to that. So, yeah. And I know you're in the same boat I'm in. Yeah. I just got a lot of things going on. So, so <laughs> I guess the next podcast will be post election. Yeah. I don't think we'll I have I mean, a, we don't know what then. We, we don't, don't, I don't know that we'll have a result by then, but we may. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there will be at least a fight to talk about. Oh, there right? will definitely be a fight to talk about. <laughs> and then eventually, Eventually, we'll actually be done with this uh, ridiculous political season and we can get back to, you know, real libertarian philosophy stuff and um, yeah. more interesting, like, governance things instead of politics things. Yeah. Um, or at least more interesting to me. Um, <laughs> True. Yeah. Well, this has been a fun season, though. It's definitely... Yeah, I mean, one thing that you have to say about them having the confidence to put up really terrible candidates is that it can be really entertaining. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Really if nothing else, it's entertaining. <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right. Yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, we'll be back after the election um, and probably before the results. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we expect to be back in a week. Um, there are some things that could get in the way of that uh, r- right now, but uh, we're planning, at least at this point in time, to be back in a week. And, um, yeah, I guess that's... That's it. Oh, um, so for those that don't know, we're now available on YouTube as well. So uh, like, subscribe on all the places that you can. Um, We're Facebook, YouTube, um, iTunes, Podbean. Um, There's, of course, the website, thelibertymike.com, where you can go anytime. Uh, The podcasts are available there, too. And anytime I write articles, they they go up there as well. Um, I haven't had a lot of that lately. (laughs) No, I just... Haven't had too much going winter's on. Winter's actually winter's better for me for that. I, I usually am more productive in the winter because I don't yeah. have to get up in the morning and do um, yard work in a hundred degree weather and all that <laughs> stuff that just kind of wears me down on my weekends. You can um, get up and write. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, so we'll be back probably in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later. <laughs>